Hey guys, welcome back to the weekly educational series. Today I'm going to be discussing cortisol. Now, cortisol is one of those hormones that has a really bad reputation, especially amongst the fitness industry. A lot of people tend to associate cortisol uh, with very negative uh, side effects. However, a lot of people don't understand the critical role that cortisol plays in the human body and some of the positive benefits that it actually provides. And I know it can be hard to understand what is right or what is wrong when it comes to cortisol due to the high amount of information there is uh, available on the internet on this topic. So the reason for today's video is to ensure you guys know the truth behind cortisol and we're going to be going through what cortisol actually is, how and why it is secreted uh, within the body, and then we're actually gonna talk about the main effects that cortisol exerts on some of the peripheral tissues within the body. So cortisol is primarily a catabolic hormone that can also be termed a glucocorticoid. Now, it is released in response to stress from the adrenal glands, okay? And it runs on a very strong uh, diurnal pattern or circadian rhythm, which you can see here. So cortisol regulation throughout the day is critical for our life and for optimal functioning. This is one of the uh, pieces of the puzzle that a lot of people tend to miss when they are talking about cortisol. Okay? So cortisol is super important for energy homeostasis to allow us to perform daily activities and even exercise throughout the day and use the right source or the most efficient source of energy. The cortisol actually counteracts hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia being insufficient levels of blood glucose in the body. Okay, and it does this by inhibiting our glucose uptake in muscles. Okay, so ensuring that there is enough blood glucose available for the nervous system to use as energy. Cortisol also increases fat mobilization during times at rest, okay, and during prolonged physical activity also increases fat mobilization. And these are only some of the critical roles that cortisol plays uh, throughout the day to ensure we are functioning optimally. Now, as you can see on this little graph here, cortisol uh, secretion goes up in the morning. Okay, so around 6 a.m. we'll generally see an increase in cortisol. Now the time in which cortisol rises will generally depend on the times that you usually wake up. Okay, this is why a consistent sleep and awakening cycle is important for optimal functioning because hormones will start to adapt to that uh, cycle, that, that rhythm, and will be secreted at appropriate times. But uh, with a general overview, cortisol with, will increase around 6 a.m. And this is to prepare us to kind of wake up and start performing daily activities. So blood pressure will rise in the morning, uh, alertness will increase, arousal will go up, okay, all getting us ready to start the day. Now, there is also a sympathetic modulation that occurs here. So sympathetic nervous system activation also tends to rise in the morning, which helps increase heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. And the sympathetic nervous system also reacts to stress. Okay, so it's not only cortisol that increases when stress is present, it's also an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which releases certain hormones, uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline, which can be termed the catecholamines, and they exert similar effects to cortisol. Cortisol just tends to potentiate those effects. Now, as the day goes on, cortisol will decrease, okay, all in preparation for sleep. Okay, so towards the end of the day, you know, around 6 p.m., blood pressure will de decrease, you'll start feeling more relaxed, okay, fatigue might start to set in because cortisol isn't mobilizing energy as well as it was earlier on in the day. And this is all in preparation, as I said, for sleep. So throughout the day, there will be uh, pulses of cortisol released, okay, and this is going to be dependent on the stress that you face during the day. Uh, severe stresses are more likely to increase cortisol, whereas smaller stresses that aren't anything your body should be very worried about will generally tend to increase um, the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline, uh, and that's more of a sympathetic response. Now, what we should be worried about 
is the chronic elevation or chronic dysfunction of cortisol levels. Okay, so when there is an abnormal urinal pattern, okay, whether it be very uh, high levels of cortisol or even very low levels of cortisol uh, throughout the body during the day, there can be some negative side effects. So the stress could be psychological stress, uh, physical stress, even emotional and social stresses can exhibit uh, increase in cortisol. And some other factors that also need to be taken into account are sleep. Okay, so sleep deprivation can definitely have an impact on cortisol regulation throughout the day. Even nutritional status, okay, so under eating is also going to impact cortisol levels. And even excessive training, so overtraining, can have an impact on cortisol levels as well. Okay, so there are a whole uh, host of different types of stress that can affect cortisol regulation throughout the day. Now, as I said, we shouldn't be worrying too much about small pulses of cortisol throughout the day, but rather the chronic uh, elevation of cortisol throughout the day or an abnormal urinal pattern. Some people who report that they wake up uh, you know, in the middle of the night or just really struggle to go to sleep may have an abnormal cortisol uh, regulation. Okay, so cortisol may not be decreasing at the end of the day, okay, making it hard for them to sleep, and it might even be spiking too early in the morning, okay, causing them to wake up. So some of the negative side effects that can occur with chronic uh, cortisol elevation include fluid retention, which a lot of people do tend to talk about, but this uh, fluid retention also comes from an increase in aldosterone which also responds to stress, okay? Aldosterone is a hormone that affects sodium, potassium, and water balance within the body, and it can cause fluid retention when elevated. So it's not just cortisol which is causing the fluid retention, okay? We've also got aldosterone, and aldosterone is a hormone that is also secreted from the adrenal gland. So along with fluid retention, we also have tissue wasting due to an increase in protein breakdown, um, Cortisol can also promote fat storage within the midsection, okay, when chronically elevated. Um, and cortisol also has a relationship with an increased calorie intake, okay. So chronic and severe stresses that do, do induce cortisol elevation tend to increase appetite and uh, make the individual consume more food, okay. We can normally term this comfort food, comfort eating. Um, whereas acute stresses that have more of a sympathetic response uh, tend to decrease appetite, which leads to an individual under-eating. Okay? The research on that is fairly limited, but there is some research that states those relationships exist, and I have actually seen that with some of my clients as well. So just something to remember there. So, overall, so far, I hope you guys have a slightly better understanding of what cortisol actually is, how it is regulated throughout the day, and how it can actually be affected by stress. And if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from what I have uh, spoken about so far, it's that chronic uh, elevations in cortisol, okay, in a disrupted pattern, is what leads to the negative side effects that a lot of people talk about. Okay, for the most part, if you are controlling your sleep, you are, your nutrition is on point, you aren't overtraining, and you are managing your stress to the best of your abilities throughout the day, especially those acute stresses that can occur throughout the day, you shouldn't have a problem with chronic elevation in cortisol levels. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, if you've watched my previous video on metabolism, I talked about the thyroid and how it interacts with the hypothalamus to, um, to the thyroid gland, how it interacts with other, other glands like the hypothalamus to produce thyroid hormone. And the way in which cortisol works is very similar. Okay, So really, it all starts with the activation of the HPA axis. So remember, HPA stands for the hypothalamic pituitary axis. That refers to the interaction that the hypothalamus has with the anterior pituitary glands and other, other glands to ultimately secrete certain hormones. So, first 
we have to think back to what actually initiates the ca this cascade of events to lead to cortisol secretion, and that is stress and your body's circadian rhythm. So what happens is the hypothalamus actually registers okay, these two factors here. And remember the hypothalamus is part of the brain Okay, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to try my best to draw it, okay, sometimes it looks something like this. You might see it uh, drawn differently, but that's the way I drew it in my previous video, so I'll stick to that. And the, the hypothalamus, as I said, registers this information and proceeds to release a certain hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone. Okay, so CRH, okay, and that is the first hormone that signals the anterior pituitary, okay, to release another hormone. Okay, so if you think back to the thyroid um, process, it's very similar, okay, so remember we've got the pituitary glands here, okay, so we've got two pituitary glands, we're generally more concerned about the anterior pituitary gland, okay, so when corticotropin-releasing hormone binds to its receptors on the gland. The gland is then forced to release what we call adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Okay, so we can uh, term this ACTH. Now, it releases uh, ACTH all the way through to the adrenal glands. And this response here is a fairly delayed and prolonged uh, response. So it's not as instant as the adrenaline release that we get when your body um, responds to a acute stress. Okay, it actually takes some time for this hormone to be released. And then when cortisol does uh, finally get released, it stays present within the blood for quite some time. Okay, I'm, I'm talking hours here. Okay, whereas adrenaline is a more of an instant reaction to an acute stress. So if you're not familiar with the adrenal glands, they're glands that sit on our kidneys. Okay, so I'm just going to draw them like this. Okay, so they look something like that. And they sit, as I said, on the, on the kidney. Okay, bear with my drawings here. Um, doesn't look too much like a kidney, but it will do. Now, again, ACTH will bind to its receptors on the adrenal gland. That's always the case. A hormone needs to bind to a receptor. And cortisol will be released from the adrenal gland, specifically the adrenal cortex. Okay, so there's two parts of the adrenal. Uh, there's the inner part, which we call the adrenal medulla, and the cortex is the outer part, which releases aldosterone and cortisol, okay? So, we get cortisol release from the adrenals, okay? So, cortisol is actually synthesized from cholesterol, okay? So, cholesterol is the precursor to cortisol, and many other steroids are within the body, okay? So, again, a lot of people um, say that cholesterol is really bad for you and it is in excessive amounts just like cortisol is in excessive amounts but uh, cholesterol is essential for the body okay it allows us to produce certain hormones just like cortisol okay so really what ACTH is doing is increasing the biosynthesis of cholesterol which leads to cortisol okay and remember this all happens because your body uh, is met with a homeostatic challenge, okay, the stressor, okay, whether it be training, whether it be due to sleep deprivation, whether it be psychological stress, like I mentioned before, okay, the HPA axis will be activated, leading to this cascade of events and ultimately cortisol secretion. So the primary tissues that cortisol exerts its effects on are the liver, uh, muscle tissue and even adipose tissue. Okay, so we're going to go through all three of these areas and talk about the effects that cortisol has. So we're going to start off with the liver. Now, liver is pretty simple. Um, okay, so we've got the liver there. 
Cortisol incre increases glycogenolysis, okay, which is the conversion of glycogen back into glucose. Remember earlier I mentioned um, that cortisol helps with energy homeostasis. Okay, one of the ways it does this is by regulating blood glucose levels. Okay, and when it senses blood glucose levels are a little too low, then it activates glycogenolysis in the liver, and this results in an increase in blood glucose. Okay, remember energy uh, primarily for your nervous system. So that's the first one. It also increases gluconeogenesis in the liver. Okay, which is the conversion of non-glucose substrates, so things like protein, um, amino acids, sorry, converts those types of substrates into glucose, again for the same reason, okay, is to maintain uh, blood glucose homeostasis. Those are the two main effects cortisol has in the liver. When it comes to muscle, things get a little more uh, towards a negative side, especially when cortisol secretion is excessive and chronic. Okay, so you've got muscle. Now, I did mention earlier that cortisol can increase protein breakdown. Okay, that is one of the main uh, negatives that comes with cortisol secretion chronically. Again, I keep saying chronically because that is really when we should be worried about cortisol. Um, and it also decreases protein synthesis. Now, in the muscle tissue, there's also a decreased uptake of glucose. Okay, and this is why we can also call cortisol an insulin antagonist. Okay, remember insulin pulls glucose into the muscle. Cortisol inhibits that from occurring to ensure blood glucose revel levels remain uh, sufficient. Okay, so there is a decrease in glucose uptake. So we've also got adipose tissue. Now within adipose, okay, so within fat, cortisol increases the mobilization of fatty acids. Okay, I mentioned this before, it does this during rest, during prolonged uh, periods of exercise, okay, when fatty acids need to be oxidized for energy. Okay, and whenever your body needs uh, increase in fat mobilization for any certain reason, cortisol will generally help with that. Okay, so that is one of the main effects that cortisol exerts on adipose tissue. Now, I mentioned earlier that cortisol can influence um, fat storage around the abdominal region. Uh, there is some research on this, even though it is slightly limited. But cortisol can definitely increase triglyceride synthesis. Okay, and this is because it increases the activity of lipoprotein lipase, okay, LPL. Um, this is an enzyme that facilitates the storage of fatty acids as triglyceride. Okay, so fatty acids come through the bloodstream. Once you've consumed fats, okay, they come through the bloodstream packaged inside what we call chylomicrons. Okay, generally it's chylomicrons that carry fats through the bloodstream. Lipoprotein lipase is the enzyme that kind of breaks the fatty acids out of the, the package, the chylomicron, and shuffles them into the fat cell so that they can combine with glycerol and form a triglyceride molecule. Okay, and cortisol increases that enzyme's activity. So those are the main effects that cortisol has on peripheral tissues. And notice how they're not all negative effects, okay? So there definitely are some negatives like decreased uh, protein synthesis, um, increased you know, triglyceride synthesis. But at the end of the day, cortisol will exert its effects depending on how it is regulated throughout the day. Okay, so if you're not looking after your stress or managing your stress well, okay, if you're sleep deprived, um, your nutritional status is poor, well, that's going to lead to cortisol dysfunctions, okay, and some of these negative side effects. But remember, it's not really cortisol which is at fault here, okay, it may be the individual's lifestyle, okay, it may be certain things that the individual is doing which are leading to cortisol uh, increases, but at the end of the day, it's just cortisol responding to the stimuli that the individual is presenting it with. Okay? Ultimately, it's just doing its job 
just like every other hormone uh, does its job within the human body. So that is all I had planned for today. Okay, so we've gone through the journal pattern, okay, that cortisol displays. We've also got the mechanism in which cortisol gets secreted. So remember it all starts the hypothalamus registering a stress, okay, um, releasing certain hormones. So we've got corticotropin releasing hormone there. Uh, anterior pituitary releases adrenocorticotrophic hormone. And then the adrenal glands release cortisol. Okay, cortisol then goes to certain tissues. Okay, so it travels through the bloodstream and exerts numerous effects on those tissues there. <laughs>